The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Friday lunch seminar. Um, just a few things to note. Um, your mic will be muted throughout the webinar to keep things simple, but um, feel free to ask questions at any time. We'll have a lot of time at the end for Q&A. Um, so there is a questions box located on the panel on the right hand side. You can sort of toggle that open and close with the orange arrow. Um, and again, just submit your questions freely. And um, if you do have any problems with the program, just try closing it out and logging back in again. That seems to work best. Um, and today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website uh, as soon as the series is over. So today's webinar will be on cabbage root maggot biology and management and a lot of research updates um, from Farouk Zaman from Cornell Cooperative Extension on Long Island. So thanks, Farouk. Take it away. Thank you, Susan, for your nice intro introduction. So, okay, so. Okay. Here. Okay, so I'm presenting here today, but uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dan Gorain, the entomologist at uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, because I took a lot of information, actually some of the slides from him, so the credits goes to him as well. Okay, so let's talk about cabbage maggot. Cabbage maggot, also known as cabbage root maggot, is a destructive insect pest of many brassica or cold crops, as you know that. And then the immature stage, the, actually the larval stage of this insect is a below ground feeder. That means the insect damage the root and below ground part of the stem. So they don't uh, uh, eat the uh, above ground part, like the head or the stem. So in my presentation today, I will focus on cabbage maggot biology, their monitoring techniques, and some control options, including our recent research update. So here in these slides, uh, you see a, a cabbage uh, maggot, and then uh, the and I'll discuss a little bit about the cabbage maggot biology and its life cycle first. Cabbage maggot, uh, maggot adults has pretty similar looks to a common housefly. However, the houseflies are considered as nuisance insect, but the cabbage fly is a damaging pest to many brassica crops. So here on the top picture, you see a female, and then the bottom is a male. As you see, the male is a little bit bigger, uh, female is a little bit bigger than male. The size has uh, some differences. And also the next slides, there are many, uh, let's talk about some alternate, uh, some crop host. There are many cultivated brassica, uh, cultivated brassica host, including head and stem crops, as well as some uh, root crops. However, the economic importance from cabbage maggot damage may be different among the uh, different brassica crop groups. Head and stem brassica may not have uh, some, uh, head and uh, stem brassica may not have uh, that kinds of uh, um, like importance when the cabbage maggots are feeding on roots. But for root brassica, the tolerance level uh, is very low, low because a few, a few damage in uh, in the root brassicas may uh, render this uh, crop unmarketable. So, uh, so the management decision may be different for different brassica crops, whether it's a head brassica or a stem brassica or a root brassica crops. Okay, so let's talk about the cabbage uh, maggot life cycle. Cabbage maggot flies have simple life cycle with four stages, that is egg, larva, pupa, and adult, as you see in the picture. And the over, they overwinter as pupae in the soil, and adult emerge, uh, first adult emergence occur in late April to mid-May on Long Island. 
So the emergence pattern uh, may vary depending on location and weather, but they stay pretty much the similar uh, range. So egg laying occurs in a few days after emergence, after the spring emergence, and then it takes a couple of days to uh, hatch into a larvae, and then, uh, uh, or we call it maggot because it's a fly, and then it takes about 10 to 12 days for pupation, then another 10 to 12 days uh, to emerge as an adult. So uh, it takes about 28 to 35 days to complete its full life cycle. And on Long Island, they produce three to four generations per year. So it may be different in different part of the uh, uh, region, like uh, generally on Northeast is uh, three to four generations per year. So typically the female actually lay eggs uh, on the base of, near the stem to the soil line or on the loose soil around the stem. So there you see if females are ready to lay eggs on and young uh, cabbage plants. Uh, actually, they laid some eggs. I see them on the, uh, uh, inside the cycle. So the cabbage maggot lay eggs on the base of the stem, as I said, near to the soil line, uh, on the stem, or sometimes on the loose uh, soil around the stem. The eggs are very small, uh, like half of the size of a rice grain, but you can see them naked eye with close inspection. And that can be used as a scouting process if you uh, watch them carefully, just around uh, soil or on the stem. So after egg hatching, newly emerged maggot starts spreading the stem below ground they don't feed that much of the uh, the green parts stay pretty much the uh, white part of the root and sometimes it is only one maggot feed on a single plant sometimes it is more than 10 maggots uh, maggots actually fill uh, feed on a um, uh, on a plant so here you see on the right uh, picture the entire root systems are gone because there are, I can see at least seven uh, maggots are feeding on that. So sometimes they also feed the stem portion that is below ground. Here in this, see the entire stem tissue is mi missing. There is no way this cabbage plant will survive or will produce marketable head. So sometimes the infestation can be very severe. And you see that in uh, this picture, it can cause significant economic losses. As you see, uh, this picture is taken from a local farm where the mature plants suddenly start wilting because of the heavy cabbage maggot feeding on the roots. So the, most of the roots were uh, missing and in a, dry, a little bit dry condition, the plants were not able to uptake water from the soil. So as a result, they wilted and died when they, within very uh, quick. And then this is very severe. It was the, pretty much the same in the entire uh, five acres field. So now let's talk about the alternate hosts. There are some alternate hosts of cabbage maggot grow in and around commercial agricultural field. So the, some of them are wild brassica plants, such, are, such as mu wild mustard, field cranny craze, hedge mustards, shepherd parts, wild radish are among those wild hosts. Uh, if you see this charts, uh, chart, you will see that uh, the cultivated brassicas like cabbage and cauliflower are most attractive. There are, uh, if you see this number on the uh, left side, these are maggot pupae per plant. You don't see that many of them on the host, but in a, on the alternate host. But if you see the cabbage and cauliflower, the number is very high. So that means once you uh, put the transplant in the main field, the party starts there. So now before moving to the monitoring and uh, scouting, uh, I have two simple survey questions for the audience. Uh, please check uh, the answers as appropriate. Okay, here is the questions. Okay, so I'll give some time, like if, uh, 30 seconds to answer this uh, question.
Okay, the answers are trickling in here. We'll give you another few moments to cast your vote for the worst brassica pest of them all. Okay. So the results are in. Looks like flea beetle is uh, the worst of all for most folks, and then caterpillars, which we kind of had to lump all together, um, and then root maggot, pretty pretty close up there, number three. A few folks saying all of the above. All right. Okay, so that's a good number to know. Um, and we have one more uh, question here, which is more related to the root maggot. On your farm, is cabbage root maggot a problem every year? Uh, somewhat of a problem every year? Problem only in some years? Seldom, never. So take a second and let us know how frequently and severe this problem is for you. Just a few more seconds. Collect these responses. Okay. Looks like. Okay, so it looks like that's somewhat of a problem every year for most folks. Um, and then some folks never seeing it sometimes, or 10% serious problem every year. Okay, so right. that's a good number. Like at least 70% of them are having some sort of problem. Mm -hmm. okay, so thank you for answering those questions. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the monitoring and scouting information. So the cabbage maggot monitoring and scouting plans are basically phenological model that is based on degree day or seasonal temperature. It's not like uh, you will be scouting, going in the field and counting the numbers of insects on the plants. It's not like that. So it's basically a degree day or seasonal temperature accumulation based um, uh, uh, monitoring. And also uh, there is a phenology based monitoring with the wild plants flowering so and there are some commercial lures are available uh, in market but they are not that much user friendly and in some cases not species specific they so often attracts a lot of non targets some other flies like seed cone maggots or something so that it's very hard to differentiate them without uh, some skill uh, it is uh, for general um, uh, people it is very hard to differentiate between those two flies uh, so in in the next few slides i'll talk about cabbage maggot monitoring briefly okay so here is this slides this uh, this slide shows the results of a lower and trap efficacy trial done back in 2014 in Newfoundland, Canada. So here you see that uh, picture one, two, three, they tested three different trap design with four different trap lures. Uh, you see the list at the bottom of that. And then um, in the middle, uh, there is two bar graph. This is showing the results. So you see that among the trap, uh, trap design, only this, the trap design here is marked as an A, B, C. So the A is a YOLO sticky card. B is this uh, um, eco spy trap. And then the C is the brassic ice trap. So among those three trap, only A, that is the yellow sticky trap, trap was successful in capturing cabbage maggot flies. However, the yellow sticky card did attract a lot of non-target flies, as you see on this card. There are, um, these are not all cabbage maggot. They attracted a lot of other uh, flies and non-target insects. So it is very hard to identify cabbage maggot from this sticky surface because you need to take out the insects uh, some sort of good uh, shapes to identify whether it's a cabbage maggot or other flies. And among the three uh, synthetic lure, uh, we found, uh, they found only the Delia lure, that is the uh, orange color bar, uh, was uh, mo the most effective. 
the other two lures, the green and then the blue, they are also attracted, but you see the uh, uh, some sort of red uh, bar that is controlled, like just only the yellow sticky uh, curd. So that is also uh, attracted some flies. So I think the Delia lure is somewhat effective uh, in monitoring flies in uh, field. So the next slide also shows, uh, the next slide shows the cabbage maggot fly emergence pattern during the season and their phenology with the alternate host. Uh, as you see the graph on the le left, this uh, bar is showing the number of the, uh, the vertical bar is showing the number of trapped flies and then the horizontal line is showing the calendar days. As you see, uh, the uh, cabbage maggot emergence starts somewhat mid-May, uh, the first generation. Then uh, we got a second peak somewhere, uh, somewhere like um, early July, and then again third peak at mid-August. And there were some uh, more smaller peaks, uh, sometimes early September. So they were pretty, pretty much uh, three. A distinctive peak. And also, if you see the um, chart on the right side, you see this peak emer emergence uh, mid May. That is the time when the yellow rocket is start, uh, start flowering. So here you see the first emergence synchronized with the yellow rocket uh, fl flowering. And then the second emergence uh, synchronized with the daily flowering. And then the third. Uh, emergence um, synchronized with the canard thistle or early goldenrod uh, flowering, and then the fourth generation that uh, is uh, syn synchronized with the new fowl and ester. So uh, beside those trap, with uh, observing those flowering pattern, you can um, uh, make a prediction that when your cabbage fly emergence peak. So this research was done, I think. Um, um, on long, uh, la, I, th I think this research was done in the New York uh, uh, Geneva station several years back. So let's move to the. Uh, there is another reliable way to predict cabbage maggot emergence by following the degree day model or the temperature model. Uh, this model is developed based on accumulated temperature requirement for developing overwintering cabbage maggot pupa to adult. Uh, so the model is available online in the Cornell website, Cornell NEWA website. Just Google search Cornell N-E-W-A. The website will come first in the list. And then you will see a list of all weather stations. Those are marked on the Northeast US map with the Google uh, uh, green circle. So these are all the weather station. So choose uh, your nearest weather station for viewing your location specific as specific prediction model. So if you go from the uh, to the website, the first um, uh, uh, appearance will be like this. And then uh, then you will be choosing your pest. Like after you open the web link, click on the pest forecast uh, in the blue menu bar, and then select the cabbage maggot of your uh, insect interest uh, from this pull down uh, menu list. And then you will be selecting your state. Like you, I, I selected here, New York, you can select your state and then a nearest weather station. So from the map uh, in a couple of slides before, so you'll be choosing which is the nearest weather station to you and then select the date and then click get re uh, report. So you will see the model in the display section on the right side of the screen. So, so here on this slide, check this uh, degree day line, that is the black line, when this one intersect the red line, that is the peak adult emergence. You see that I choose the date April 2nd, 2019. So that means the degree days are not enough for uh, accumulation is not enough for first emergence appearance. So this is just the beginning of the April. So if you if I show you this slide, that is actually a 2015 uh, prediction. So here you see uh, the first generation 
peaks. You see that where the red line intersect, the first generation peaks at uh, like sometimes early May. So th that was the time when the 50% emergence happened. So now you know that when the first emergence emerged. And then this is the 2018 where I, uh, I, I'm showing the, all the generation emergence. As you see, uh, the, sec uh, the first, the spring emergence peaks at around 475 degree deaccumulation. That was May 6. And as you go, the second generation emerged somewhere uh, uh, like our, uh, like the, um, uh, I think it's the third week of uh, June, and then the second generation, second summer generation emerged sometimes um, uh, around uh, mid July, and then the fourth generation uh, in the later part of the season. So the, uh, this uh, uh, model will help you to precisely timing and planning the cabbage maggot control application in field. As you see, uh, this blue arrow that is show pointing towards the spring emergence. So if you would like to use uh, net covering to your uh, cabbage uh, uh, transplant, then you will have to put that like when the maggot emerge, uh, cabbage uh, maggot flies start uh, to emerge. But if you have like a field, you know there were cabbage maggot infestation before, and you know the population is before, I would suggest like you wait until the, all the first emergence happened because uh, if you cover your field with the net, then there might be some emergence from the ground within, uh, within this period. So, so this model will uh, help you adjusting the planting date depending on population status. So now move on to cabbage maggot control options. So, so uh, like the, in this section, I'll talk about available cabbage maggot control option, option, past research results, and our current research and demonstration update that is done in the Cornell uh, University Lyric Field Facilities in Riverhead, New York. So back. Uh, so let's uh, see that what are the currently available insecticide or control options for cabbage maggot. So you see that there is a list of seven insecticides uh, leveled for cabbage maggot control in brassica crops. However, not all the insecticides are leveled for all brassica crops. There are some limitations. Uh, there are some limitations for crop use some for application method, as well as regional re restriction. If you see the uh, Barrymark and Corazon, that's with the start, that is not for Long Island use. Uh, so, so there are some limitation uh, for some crops. Some crops can be used only, some insecticide can be used only for head and stem brassica, some, some for uh, not for use into the root brassica. If you see the uh, capture LFR, those are uh, not for root brassica. So there are some limitations except Lord's band that can be generally used for anything. And also, the, uh, some often the effectiveness of some materials does not meet commercial grower expectation that you will see in some of the later slides. So the, as I say, the Lord's ban is the market standard that can be used for any purpose. There are some, uh, uh, like some court process going on regarding future availability of this chloropyrifos, uh, chloropyrifos or large band. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court ruling is under appeal. So there is a great deal of uh, uncertainty about the final fate of the large band. So large band, so it is important to look for alternative materials and methods for controlling cabbage maggot that is highly dependent on large band. So, in 2017 and 18, actually, uh, I, I think let's talk about some of the past results. So back in 2008, uh, the experiment, an experiment was done by entomologist Dan Rain here at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. The results shows that if you see those bar, uh, this 
vertical line is showing the undamaged route, and then the uh, horizontal bar is showing the treatments. If you see the Rime bar, so that looked like was very effective uh, uh, about protecting cabbage from cabbage uh, root maggot damage. The uh, the efficacy was as good as Larsban, but the other three treatment, uh, like uh, other two treatments, like Capture LFR and an experimental product, was not that uh, good. It was almost pretty much the same eff effective as control. So, and then there was another experiment uh, done in uh, pretty uh, long back in 1996 with uh, the nematode. Uh, this is showing the uh, the uh, showing the trial with entomopathogenic nematode. Some efficacy was found with very high uh, application rate. That is, 1,000 um, nematode per plant to as high as 200 uh, nematodes per per plant. So that's very high rate. And then the, we we have seen some success. Uh, they, they 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 found some success as you see the damaging rate. So this is not the percent damage. This is based on the damage rating from zero to, I believe, from 100. So uh, as you see, there were some success. The 25, I think zero, zero to 25 was the lowest damage rating. And then the higher damage rating goes up to 100. So there were some uh, uh, efficacy. But if you see the cost for each plant for one application that was, 18 cents per plant. So if you need three or four, so that's very expensive. So this is, uh, in commercial standpoint, there are some limitations of using that high numbers, but we tried something with the lower numbers. You'll see the results later. Farouk, can I ask a, a question if you go back to that graph? Um, could you just explain the difference between the blue and the red bars there? So the, uh, the red bars are actually the augmented. This is a lab research with like the 20 eggs were uh, put uh, in a I think a pot or something, and then they augmented the um, uh, the uh, the nematode into that pot. So that is the red bar. So you see, like still the damage rating. Uh, uh, that was a little bit more successful than the field. I think the uh, the natural. Oh, the, the augmented one was the blue, but the red one was the natural. So the natural, I see some of the damage rating. You see that the, the ratings, the 100 is the dead plant, 50 deep feeding, and then, so the success, in natural, the success was a little bit more, but in the augmented, I think it was less. It looked like 45, that means the deep feeding, and then, so, this is an old research, so I'm not quite sure that how, what is their um, like uh, methodology or how many days they wait for that, how many times they applied. So it is not quite sure. So, but we did a trial so, with pathogenic nematode in field. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here uh, uh, there is another experiment. Uh, done by again Dan Gilrain here at Long Island back in 2008. The result uh, this time he used uh, this Entrust as a seed treatment and compared with Larsban and then the control. So the control is a thyrum that's a fungicide that is used I think as a seed treatment to protect from disease but uh, on the top the entrust uh, was used as with a uh, different rate. It was used as a seed treatment, but the result was not that promising. As you see, the red bars uh, um, with entrust treatment were not significantly different than the control. So the uh, the blue bar is actually a different trial. So that uh, the infestation was not that high. I think uh, that's why you see the control. Uh, there were 70% undamaged uh, roots. So that's why the first trial may not uh, that productive. But in the second trial, uh, we found 
um, pretty good control with Lorsban, but the other treatments are not doing well. So that looked like the uh, C treatment with Antrust was not that promising. So now move on to our recent research that we did at Cornell Cooperative uh, Cornell University Long Island Horticulture Research Center in 2017 and 18. So we uh, we used several treatments. Some of them are insecticide treatment. There are four insecticide treatments. You see the Tolfin Pirate, Capture LFR, and Trust, Varimark, and uh, our market standard was the large ban. And then we also used a row cover with more durable, durable technique nettings. And also we tested the antimopathogenic nematode. That was the uh, uh, sternum of Felsia. So we used diff also different application method. If you see in this chart, we used the four inches banded closed furrow application. We did the pre uh, plant trade rinse, pre plant trade rinse plus, plus a targeted spray. Uh, so we also did the net covering or road, co road covering at planting. So there are several application methods as well as several, several treatments. So let's talk about a little bit about the. Uh, treatment, uh, how we applied the uh, trade runs, uh, uh, drenching or pre-planned trade drenching. So we drenched insecticide 24 hours before transplanting in, uh, in the main field. We used a backpack sprayer with low PSI, that it was 20 PSI for dispensing approximately uh, 1.25 milliliter of the prepared materials for each plant. That is equal to 250 milliliter drench per uh, plant and for uh, to, uh, per, uh, per tray that is actually holding 200 plants. So 250 milliliter of the prepared uh, materials on 200 plants. And after spraying the insecticide over the foliage, we sprayed another 200 milliliter of uh, fresh water uh, to, to wash off the insecticide materials from the foliage to the root ball. So uh, by the way, the plants were stopped irrigating 24 hours prior to insecticide drench drenching so that the drenched liquid can be absorbed by the plants quickly and no leaching happened. The amount of insecticide was calculated exactly the uh, following the level insecticide. As for example, for Verimark, we used 13.5 fluid ounce of Verimark per acre. That was applied over 16,786 plants at 11 inch uh, uh, spacing. So if you make them on floods, that will be 84 trays. So the total amount uh, of water uh, used was only 11 gallon applied to about 250 acres, uh, 50 square feet area. So it is very easy to handle compared to acres of treatments in the field. Here in this picture, you see that we actually sprayed three trays with the 720 milliliter prepared materials first. It is very concentrated. So that's why we used another 250 milliliter or 750 milliliter water for three trays to wash up the material so we don't get any phytotoxicity. Actually, we did not get any phytotoxicity with this method. It sounds like very concentrated, but there were no problem with the barrier. And then for the uh, row cover um, uh, exclusion netting, we used 80 gram technique, uh, technique uh, net that is mainly used for protecting baddie fruits from uh, spotted wing drosophila. These nets are much durable, can last over four to five years. It comes with 30 feet uh, wide uh, width and 250 feet long. Uh, so 30 feet wide can cover up to four rows in one run. So there are 26 feet wide uh, width available upon request. 
So there is a, uh, I think, Northeast distributor. This company is a Canadian company, but there is a Northeast distributor who actually supply or take order uh, from the Northeast growers. So here is the exclusion net installation. Uh, you see that uh, you need uh, to put, uh, to seal those side side very well. Otherwise, the flies will uh, find a way to go in. That uh, will be a problem. And then in the next slide, you see the uh, four weeks old plants are under the nets. So they are growing very fine. That They are uh, actually better than growing outside. The plants were a little bit bigger inside. And then we used the overhead irrigation, including those net coverings. So there was no problem with this overhead irrigation. Actually, the water can pass through well uh, um, on the bed. So there was no problem with this uh, net coverings for irrigation purpose. And for some treatment, you see that we used a uh, post uh, uh, plant targeted application. Uh, so after two weeks from transplanting, so please note that when you are applying, for, uh, uh, when I say targeted application, that means your nozzle will have to point towards the base of the stem and soil. That's where the eggs are laid and then the newly hatched larvae will be very close to the stem. Here you see in this yellow arrow, the eggs are here. So when you are um, applying insecticide, your nozzle should be target this year. If you are applying your insecticide over the top of the plant, so many of the materials will not uh, reach up to this area. So then the efficacy will not be that good. So, uh, so after planting uh, and uh, putting our treatments uh, at uh, uh, four weeks, we started uh, collecting um, uh, uprooting uh, all those cabbage plants to check for cabbage maggot uh, larva, uh, cabbage maggot damage, as well as damage rating, and then the number of maggot comes with the root ball. So here is the results. So this graph is showing uh, the control of cabbage maggot damage uh, in cabbage. So the vertical line is showing the percent undamaged cabbage root and then the horizontal line is showing the treatments as you see that we have like eight treatments including a control so if you see the control the blue bar the control so we got uh, like uh, only few undamaged uh, cabbage roots so that means the population was very good if you see the, uh, the uh, standard large band yeah, we got pretty good control, over 90% control. But look at the row cover. We got almost 99% um, uh, roots without any um, uh, cabbage maggot damage. So, oh, but, uh, by the way, uh, this bar is showing the, uh, the damage from 80 plants per treatment so this is the average from 80 plants that was in four uh, collected 20 per replication so here you see the berry mark that was the only the uh, at uh, applied at pre-transplant drench uh, drench so we found over 81 percent undamaged roots so that was pretty good but not as good as uh, uh, large band or the uh, uh, the low cover, and then look at the uh, end trust. So we also found like about 45% undamaged cabbage root. So there were another 40, 55% uh, damaged roots. But in uh, my next slide, I'll show uh, we also uh rated the intensity of damage that will show a little bit of clear picture like okay although we are getting some damage for from every treatments but how those damage was like whether they were more uh like slightly damaged or they were high damage so i'll show you those in my later slides so the capture lfr dolphin pirate and then the nematode was not doing that good so in in the, our experiment, we used 3,000 nematode per plants that was applied at planting. 
So now this is the showing the results of uh, our 2018 trial. In 2018, we, uh, we included two more treatments. Uh, one of them uh, was Entrust application at trade ranching plus a targeted application after two weeks. We did the same uh, treatment with Verimark. Uh, uh, a trade range plus a, a two weeks after two weeks a targeted application. So here is the result. This line is showing the undamaged cabbage root. Again, you see we got a pretty good population. We got only 10% undamaged roots from in our control plots, but the large band uh, we found about 78% uh, undamaged roots. But look at this very mark. Uh, trade range plus a targeted application. This time we uh, got some good results compared to the Verimark trade range alone. So we found over 85% undamaged roots. So that is pretty good. So the uh, so uh, the efficacy improved when you applied at uh, um, a targeted application after two weeks. So here again, the row cover was the best. Again, 99% um, uh, undamaged roots. So there were not, no damage inside. And then look at this entrust. So the only entrust, which was uh, the entrust application only as a trade range, that gave us about 55% undamaged root, a little better than the 2017. But when we applied uh, uh, after two weeks, then the efficacy increased up to 70 percent so that's a, a good improvement again the Tolson pirate capture lfr and then the nematode was not that good we, we see some efficacy from the capture lfr that was only 40 percent undamaged root so then we uh, so as you see that each treatment have some damaged root so then we and rated those damage severity uh, from a scale of zero to 10. So zero means no damage. Then you see that one rate as a, the rating of one is little damage, two, some a little more damage, three. Again, you see the picture, there are more damage, four, five, six. As the damage increased, we actually rate them higher. And then eight, nine, 10 is the severe damage, as you see the nine and 10, the roots are almost gone. So the plants were severely affected with this situation. So when we pl uh, plotted those damage rating on this graph, so this is showing, showing again, so this vertical line is showing the root damage rating from zero to 10, and this is the, show, the uh, horizontal line is showing the treatments. If you see the, uh, the ratings from the, untreated control plot so that was over 3.25 so out of 10 0 uh, 10 so we found 3.25 uh, ratings uh, for control uh, for uh, plants that were damaged in control plot look at this large one very few uh, less than 0.2 uh, uh, score for large one so very few damage although there were only few damaged plants but when we rated them we see the damage were very low for very mark again it was low row cover no damage because the 90 percent plants were clean and trust we found some damage remember the 55 percent damaged roots were there are uh, mm, uh, or uh, uh, 30 to 55 percent, but those damages were not that big. So it was uh, the score was less than one. So the one you see that it's very, uh, um, very low damage. For for Tolson pirate and capture uh, capture LFR, the damage was very high. So the score it got a big score. So again in 2007, similar results. So there was no differences so in capture LFR, Dolphin Fire, or Felshi, but the damage intensity in and trust and very mark and Larsman were somewhat low. So then we checked the, the cabbage maggot that comes with the root ball. So as you see in this graph, the number of maggot per uh, root. So we found very uh, about two and a half uh, maggot per root from uh, from the plants in the control plot. 
However, for large span, very mark, row cover, there are only few. Dolphin pirate and capture, there were about one and a half to two megawatt per load. In 2018, very similar results, very low in and trust, very mark and large span and in row cover. So this is a very clumsy slide, so I'm not going to all the details. All I will say, look at those two circles. So we actually collected data on the plant height, plant width, and then the foliar damage, as well as head diameter, head weight, and the USDA grade, and then the, uh, the head quality. You see the head quality was very good in uh, plants under the row cover, as well as very much. But compared with the large band, so if you see the foliar damage number here in this column, so you see that we found only 0.2% uh, foliar damage from very much treated plot. That is very low compared with the large band. That was 3.7. And then the other was very high, but the row cover, very few. So that means the very much is also protecting uh, uh, cabbage plants for lepidoptera damage. And you see, uh, uh, Lepidoptera uh, pests such as the imp imported cabbage worm or cabbage looper or diamondback moth damage, mostly imported cabbage uh, worm damage. That is our dominant pest here. And also, you see the row cover, then uh, there were nothing inside. So the uh, row cover will protect the plants from the cabbage maggot. Again, in 2018, the lower table, we did similar kinds of rating, but we don't have any harvest quality ratings because of the rot, rotting damage. So you see the plant's quality was high for those treatments. So I think now we move to the, some of the observations. So the, so the uh, Larsman gave the consistent, excellent results. And then the very mark trade range alone, that was good, gave us the 60% to 80% uh, uh, control. Row cover, that was excellent, over 90% controls. The end trust, uh, trade and wrench alone gave us the moderate control, but the efficacy increased up to 70% after uh, a targeted application two weeks post transplant. So the, our observation, the large band, very mark, and um, the row cover and end trust we uh, gave a good maggot damage. Uh, the maggot damage severity was very lowest in, from this treatment. And then the fewer maggots on roots there. And then we also observed that cabbage uh, appears to compensate some of the maggot injury. As you see, the damage injury was very low in those treatment. Although there were some damage, the intensity was low. And head quality was very high in very mark and recover in 2017. Uh, uh, okay, I think uh, we have some plans for our future work. We'll be testing some treatment as well as uh, doing some row cover works to see the economics and then the field uh, operation and all the practicability of uh, putting those nets. Some of the other treatments we'll be using the barrier, mulch, those. And also we will be uh, assessing some of the trap efficacy. So I think that was my last, last slide. I would like to uh, acknowledge some of the participating growers as well as some of the summer assistants here. So I, that's that was my last slide. Uh, feel free, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Farouk, for that. Um, so much interesting research been going on um, with you and Dan at, on Long Island for the past bunch of years. Um, so thanks for sharing. Um, a couple of questions, and again, for those of you tuning in, please feel free to submit your questions via the text box on the side panel there. Um, I had just a few um, questions. Um, it's pretty uh, exciting to have some new materials. We've been, um, you know, Laura's ban has been the only thing available for such a long time um, and so many limitations with that material. Um, one of which is that it can't be used by organic growers. So it's nice to have the Veramark, which is really effective and because of that systemic activity um, 
it's protecting, like you mentioned, the foliage from things like caterpillars and flea beetles as well. Um, so that's really great. And um, now the Entrust has recently um, had this label expansion where it can now be used on some brassica crops. And I wonder if um, you or maybe Dan could talk a little bit about the limitations of using Entrust, like where, um, for which crops and how it can be used and which crops it can't be used. Okay, so if you see the slides about, uh, I think, the uh, limitations for, uh, for Entrust, um, Dan, maybe if you could uh, chime in here. I know you had um, written earlier to the email list about how it can only be used for, um, you know, the transplanted crops and not the root crops. Yeah, it's for head and this is Dan Gilrain. It's only for head and stem brassicas. The you can you can use Entrust on root brassicas, but it does not have the labeling for cabbage maggot on that part of the label. Um, so. Uh, the section label for head and stem brassicas does have somewhat explicit directions on cabbage maggot control. Um, uh, this is for Entrust SC. And by the way, there's a comparable material radiant, which is not, not for organic growers uh, like the Entrust is, but it's a similar, similar active ingredient that has very same, uh, identical actually labeling. Um, one of the limitations with Entrust or with radiant is that there's a limited amount you can use per acre per year on any one crop. So you can get maybe three up to five uh, applications uh, depending on the rate you're using um, and if you're targeting cabbage maggot. I think part of what Farouk was trying to do and, and, and what we've been trying to do here is to see if we could improve the performance of Entrust uh, starting with an application to plants in the flats before they were put in the field. So they go out pre-charged with a little uh, bit of Entrust or whatever uh, other treatments we're using, and then follow up after a period of time um, with directed types of applications. This is not exactly in accordance with the label, but we're trying to maybe give this as big an opportunity as possible uh, to control cabbage maggot. Part of it, the issue is that we're not always certain when cabbage maggots are active. Uh, maybe you don't have access to weather data, you're not sure what the model's gonna say, or you just have to act no matter what uh, you know, the weather is or what's going on. So we were doing these trials irrespective of what the cabbage maggots were actually, the flies were actually doing in the field, um, similar to what growers might do on their own. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and we have done similar research at UMass and seen the same thing that uh, tray drench with Entrust alone wasn't quite enough to get good control, but if you make that follow-up application in the field, um, you can get yeah. pretty good um, control there. Um, and one thing we, we have to look at, too, is we're pretty careful that when we do these trials, we want to see what the population is out there. So you look at the control plants, and if they have a high level of infestation, that means you've got a good population. So it makes for a more severe test of whatever you're doing. Um, if you do these trials, and we showed some data where the, the population was pretty low, and I wouldn't pay a lot of attention to those kind of trials where the population is low to start with. I mean, getting a little suppression might be good in that case, but it's not, these don't end up being very good tests for these uh, for these trials when you do it with a low population. Um, so it's always good when you look at data like this to keep that in mind. Yeah, also like the, uh, uh, if you see the Entrust uh, damage in intensity score, you see that there were 55% damaged plant, but the damage was not that bad uh, compared to the other treatments. So you, uh, for the uh, uh, head and stem brassica, so some feedings on the root may be acceptable. So that may not yeah. create a problem. Right, right. Because what we were discussing and uh, what Fruk's been doing is uh, um, we're looking not only at whether there is any damage, but the severity of it. So it looks like Entrust not only reduces the uh, um, amount of damage throughout the field, but also the severity on initial, on initial uh, individual plants. Uh, for a plant like broccoli or cabbage, that's really good. I mean, if you just get lower levels of damage, maybe the plants can survive um, even through a, a high population or high level infestation, if you can just reduce the severity on that particular plant. 
of course, you're dealing with something like radish where uh, a little bit of damage and a, a tunnel inside the root is totally unacceptable. Um, reduction level of damage may not be as, as uh, helpful, as meaningful if uh, high quality is, uh, and low level of damage is what's needed. Great, thanks for that discussion. Um, so the other thing you seem to show um, clearly was that the netting worked really well and um, obviously people have been using Reme probably for a long time, but now there are sort of more of these um, mesh insect nettings that um, get around some of the issues with like overheating in the summer. Um, and so I wonder if there are growers uh, listening in who want to chime in via the questions box about whether or not um, they have tried using this TechNet or any of the other products out there like ProtectNet. Um, and mm -hmm. they say you can get four to five years out of these materials. And I just wonder if um, growers have experience with that and they're, how many years they would say they're able to get. Um, but I wondered with your um, research trials, um, if you had any advice for um, managing weeds under the netting. So uh, that's a good question. Actually, uh, we have uh, uh, the trial where we uh, uh, where we set up our trials. So we used herbicide at the beginning of the season. So that. Uh, that's why we found less of the weed problem. However, we have that in mind because in the later part of the season, we see some weeds come uh, growing inside those nets and it was hard to control them. So that's why we are planning for a different experiment this year, like whether uh, how we can improve that situation. So we will be yeah. trying some mm -hmm. sort of uh, growing cabbage on a black mulch, whether we can reduce the weed issues. If it may be feasible with any smaller scale cultivation, maybe for organic growers, it may not be practical for large scale mm -hmm. uh, uh, growing. But we'll uh, see. We'll try this year, like how we can handle the uh, weed control issues under the net coverings. And you may not need to have the uh, net or the reme over the crop the entire season it, uh, you may just need it on during the first period of establishment and after that you could remove it and then do cultivation or, or whatever you choose to do for weed control at that point um I was also thinking seen... about, uh, uh, sorry uh, i was also thinking about keeping the entire season to protect them from course, the yeah. wind damage so that's why it, i was thinking like whether right. uh, uh, because the cost to compensate some of the cost, just not using the insecticide for the right. I was as well yeah, as I was going to say definitely we we can get uh, flea beetle control as well as uh, control of the caterpillars and yeah. um, with the net that's placed on for the duration. Um, but if that's not necessarily important or um, you need to, you could remove the covers earlier. Um, and just to, until the plants get really, really well established. We, we have occasionally had times when even fairly large established plants have gotten pretty serious damage from cabbage maggots. So that could be a concern. It depends on the severity and how many, how, what the population is like in any one year, uh, which can be maybe a little bit hard to know. But it's Fruk saying, yes, you, might, you could possibly balance some of the extra cost for this netting because you would not need to be applying controls for caterpillars or for flea beetle. True, true, thanks. Um, okay, I think that pretty much wraps up our session for today. Um, and so thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks a lot to Farouk and also Dan for um, the presentation today. And please tune in next Friday at noon for our discussion on flea beetles. Thank you, Sue, and thanks. Thank all you. Them. Thanks, everybody. All right. See you next time. See you.